Carlos Ramirez, owner of NVS Audio in Roselle, New Jersey. This is uh, part one of a multi-part video. Um, it's a question I get asked all the time, and it's why you need a DSP when doing motorcycle audio. Well, when really doing any sort of high quality audio, you definitely need a DSP. There's a few reasons for it. I don't want to get too technical. I just want to make it simple and really, really easy to understand. So I don't care if you're using a beautiful aftermarket radio like the Sony 7000, which many people are running on their Harleys, or if you're running a stock GT or GTS radio. If you're doing audio on your bike, especially especially with the stock radio there's a factory EQ curve that has to be defeated you have to flash the radio now it's like anything else can you get away with it yes but what's the sense of doing something half-assed so if you want to get the best possible sound you don't just want to get okay sound you're not buying three four five six seven hundred dollar speakers to get okay sound and one of the reasons I have to make the video is A, a lot of people ask for it. B, some of the questions that I get asked on a daily basis is crazy. So I have somebody trying to do a uh, line leveler and uh, the Biketronics line leveler, I've spoken about it before. It's a really good piece, entry level piece. You want it to run amplifier, two speakers on a bike, no problem. This person was trying to run subwoofers on his 10 speaker bike using uh, stock radio on the line leveler and he was wondering why he was getting no output from the subwoofer That's because the line leveler was set to about 200 Hertz So 200 Hertz blocks off all your base. You have no base whatsoever at all So he adjusted the line leveler to get rid of the nasty 150 Hertz spike that the Harley radio has built into it But at the same time he erased all the base below that that he needed for his JL Audio TW3s to work so the main reason you need a DSP is when you're running, especially mid-bass drivers, six inch and eight inch speakers, the ones that don't have a tweeter in the center. If you look at the box, for example, the Bema that we just did a review on. So if you look at the frequency response on the box, the speaker wants to stop playing at 10,000 Hertz and it wants to start playing at 95 Hertz so without a DSP if you just use the high-pass filter then you could set the high-pass filter on some of the radios you could set it to 95 but then when the speaker plays up past 10,000 how do you make it stop at 10,000 so when you use a DSP the DSP allows you to set what's called a bandpass filter so you can start that speaker playing at 95 Hertz and you could stop it at 10k that's what the manufacturer suggests that's not necessarily the best point because every bike is different every application is different but without using a DSP how are you going to set up a bandpass filter you could have a radio that has a good DSP and a good EQ built in but you can't set bandpass filters unless you're running some of the newer pioneer head units that let you set up network mode but then again do you really want to use your $300 head unit which already has to do CarPlay, Android Auto, FM. It's got 50 watts by four amplifier going that claims going to your speakers. It's got a Bluetooth chip that it's got to use its processor for. It's got to decode FLAC. It's got to decode MP3. It has to handle the input from your handlebar controls. Um, some of them play CDs. So on top of all those functions, you also want it to be your DSP. So how much money and time do you think the engineers of the head unit put into the DSP in that radio? A dedicated DSP, all the money and time went into signal processing, making sure that it can control the sound the way it's supposed to. If you're trying to let your head unit be your DSP, the head unit's got a lot of stuff going on, and the DSP in the head unit is a very, very basic watered down entry level DSP. It's just a feature put in there just to sell more head units. I'm not even a fan of DSPs built into amplifiers because then you're married to that amplifier and you can't switch it because if you switch the amp you lose your DSP function. So I like a separate DSP and a separate amplifier. 
Same goes true for the crossovers built into the amplifiers. I appreciate the fact that Soundish will improve the crossovers in their amplifiers, but I don't use them, don't need them. Mandatory at NVS Audio, every bike we build gets a DSP. It makes it easier to tune the bike, it makes the bike sound better, it gives you so much more control, I can actually see what's going on. Plus, when you do the builds and once you set all the gains on the amplifier with a meter or an oscilloscope or a DD1 and all the amplifiers, so you found your clipping from your head unit, so you adjusted your head unit for maximum undistorted output, then you go into your DSP, maximum undistorted output, then you go from your DSP to your amplifiers and figure out the maximum AC voltage and undistorted output from your amplifiers. Now that that's all set up, you can sit back and tune from inside the DSP. You no longer have to physically touch the amplifiers at all. So it makes it much simpler. And then one of my favorite things about tuning DSPs is you can literally mute every single output channel. So you can mute the tweeters. That way when you mess with the subwoofers, you don't have to worry about blowing your tweeters. You can mute this speaker, you can mute this speaker, you can play just the tweeters to make sure they're not distorting, you can shut them off, then you can move to your sixes, adjust them, then you can shut them off, then you can move to your eights, adjust them, then you can shut them off, then you can move to your subs, adjust them, then shut them off. DSPs are, if you break a DSP down to its most entry level, most basic, it's a simple device. It's, it does what a crossover does, and then it also adds an EQ. Some of them offer line drivers, some offer signal summing. It's all basic stuff that people are just scared of. Most people that say you don't need a DSP is because they don't know how to use it. You already have a great audio system in your bike. So you spent money on Bama speakers or Ground Zero speakers or Arc Audio speakers or Diamond audio speakers or Euphoria speakers, you spend a ton of money on the speakers. You spend a ton of money on the bike. You spend five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars on amplifiers. Is a three, four hundred dollar device really keeping you from making your setup sound the best that it can? So you already have a great audio system. Adding a DSP will improve every aspect of its performance, whether it's making sure you don't blow up your tweeters making sure your speakers are in phase because with most DSPs you can invert phase on every single f that's something we'll get into another video phasing is super duper 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 important and just because you hooked up the red wire to the red terminal and the black wire to the black terminal does not mean all the speakers on your bike are in phase sometimes that's called uh, so sometimes speakers are electronically in phase which means positive is positive negative and negative but sometimes they're acoustically out of phase so crossover points affect phasing distance and angle of the speakers affect phasing so you can manipulate the speaker uh, the frequency of the speakers inside the DSP and you can invert the phase 180 degrees in most of these DSPs and these are all tools built into the DSP like a lot of people don't use the time alignment we use the time alignment because it strengthens mid bass response so every speaker wants to naturally do its own thing if you take a speaker and put it in a speaker pod and just run signal to it if you run pig noise to it and just look there's gonna be peaks just it's just a natural characteristic of the speaker Certain points can be really high, certain points can be really low, and that's just what the speaker does in that enclosure. If you buy a speaker or if you go on the speaker manufacturer's website and you click on the speaker, you see the graph that's got the squiggly lines at the top or the bottom, that's showing you what the speaker is doing as they're running a pink noise track through the speaker. So if you look at the graph, and most of them have an impedance response under the speaker. so really bad things happen on the bottom part of that graph and on the very top part of that graph. So you'll see that the graph is drawn from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, but the frequency of the response of the speaker is only 100 to 5,000. That's because the speaker designer says the speaker can play this, but it does much better playing just this. So if you take that paperwork that came with the speaker and plug those numbers into the DSP, it's a really good starting point. It's, it's not going to be spot on. There's going to be variations and changes you have to make. But if you grab the paperwork that came with the tweeter and the tweeter tells you 5K to 20,000 hertz at 12 dB, that's where you should start. 
if you grab the six and a half and it says 200 to 5,000 that's where you should start and then listen to it and I always get a lot of flack for using RTA to tune a lot of people say oh I tune by ear guess what I tune by ear too but I use the RTA first to see if there's any problems if there's phasing issues if there's something that looks funny I could see it on the screen way faster than I can hear it then I can address the problem and after everything said and done I got everything looking good on the screen then I load up my 10 tuning songs that I use to tune every car and every bike because these are songs I've been listening to for 10 20 years and I've heard them on 10 and 20 thousand dollar reference sound systems so I know what they're supposed to sound like and then I can hear if there's problems there if there's a problem with Phil Collins voice if Alicia's keys voice doesn't sound right if the mid bass doesn't come in right on the Hotel California when the, the, the bass drum comes in. It, these are all things that I listen for and I tune by ear after I tune with the RTA. Just simple, simple, simple things. Um, everybody thinks that the DSR-1 is my favorite DSP because I talk about it the most. It's not true. The DSR-1 is the most simple and since I help a lot of people over the phone, that's the one I recommend. It's the one that's been supported the most by the motorcycle industry and it's the one that companies make the most plug-and-play harnesses for. So Rockford offers a plug-and-play harness for their DSP. I data like Maestro offers one for the, the Rockford DSR1 DSP. Uh, Chris from Garage Bagger Stereo offers custom T harnesses for almost any DSP, but I know he stocks ones for the Rockford. American Hardbag makes custom T harnesses. So it's easier for me to help you if you're using the most popular DSP on the market. Plus there are so many files we have stored on our shop tuning phone and our shop tuning iPad that we can literally look for a tune that's similar to yours and just email it to you. It literally takes about 10 seconds to load a tune into a Rockford DSR-1. So it, what's nice about it is if your DSP fails and you have to get a new one and you have the tune saved, you can literally plug it in and upload your own to old tune and you're back at it. Not all DSPs allow you to do it that easily. Plus, it lets you do it over Bluetooth. So um, DSR-1 is a good, solid DSP. It's not my favorite DSP, but it's the easiest to show people how to use. So the first video that we do on this how-to step-by-step basics of DSP tuning is going to be with the Rockford DSR-1. The we, We're an authorized dealer for about 15 different brands of DSPs, and I know how to use about 30 different DSPs. There's very few DSPs on the market I have not touched. So the Rockford DSR-1. The Arc Audio PSM. I heard Arc Audio is working on a new one and I'm really excited about that. Arc Audio PSM is probably one of my favorite entry-level DSPs. One of the only DSPs that actually belongs on a motorcycle because this thing's actually weather resistant. It comes with a rubber boot. It's the smallest. It's the easiest to squeeze in places. But the software is not too user-friendly. It would be really hard for me to walk somebody through using an ARC Audio PSM and it doesn't have Bluetooth. So this is a six channel DSP. The Rockford's an eight channel DSP. Um, the PSM software is only on a PC. The Rockford software is smartphone or tablet based. Um, really excited for the new ARC Audio DSP. I heard it's going to be eight channels. Um, hopefully they add Bluetooth to it. but. Um, if the ARC Audio DSP had two more channels and Bluetooth, it would be a powerhouse. And they got to work on that software a little bit. I have no problem with the software. I can breeze through it, but it's really hard for me to walk somebody through the software. AD DSP. We use it a lot, a lot, a lot at the shop. And it's actually, um, it's the, in my opinion, the AD DSP, the Dayton DSP, the Ground Zero DSP, they're all clones of each other. They're all super similar. The software looks almost identical. They all work really good. They don't really have flaws except connection issues, but anything Bluetooth has a connection issue. Uh, there's the Ground Zero DSP. And obviously these are all DSPs we have in stock because we use them all the time, whether it's bike or car. Now on this side is my favorite, favorite, favorite DSPs. Audison Bit 10. Uh, limitation to the Bit 10 is it's only five channels of output, but um, this thing is a powerhouse. I love this thing. Uh, we use this on bikes every once in a while. Our upgraded DSP that we use for competition bikes, if we have space, 
because this thing does not fit in the fairing you got to do a ton this this is the size of some of these amplifiers that we use but the Hertz H8 DSP this is what we run in Wonderful's bike this is what I run on both my competition bikes the Hertz H8 DSP is a powerhouse because it has optical input uh, which we use for high-res players it has speaker level input it has RCA input What's nice about the speaker level input, and what's nice about this DSP and the Bit 10 DSP is it's got a feature where it fa actually removes the factory EQ curve. It's a big deal for Harleys because if you have a GT or a GTS radio and you don't have access to get the radio flashed flat, you can actually use a Hertz H8, Audison Bit 10, or an Audison Bit 1 HD and tell it to take out the factory EQ curve. So you run the software, you run the test tones that come with the software, it analyzes the signal of the factory radio, and then it says, hey Carlos, this signal's not flat. Would you like me to flatten it for you? And then something that doesn't happen on Harleys, but it happens on cars, it says, hey, hey Carlos, I see that I have a tweeter signal and a mid bass signal. Would you like me to sum them together and create one signal? And you could tell it yes or no. So that issue we don't have on Harleys, or not yet. We might have in the future. But um, it's nice that once it sees the factory Harley EQ curve, you could tell it, hey, get rid of that, flatten it out for me. It will do it automatically. So the Audison software is a little bit tricky. The Hertz software is a little bit tricky. But once you get used to it, you literally just follow the steps. So you can install it, send signal in. It'll tell you, OK, play this track, turn the potentiometers on the DSP until they briefly start to flash. So. There's the software CD comes with it. Obviously, Harleys don't come with a CD player. If you need me to email you the files, because I have them in my Dropbox, or you can convert them to a thumb drive and plug it in that way, but um, I can send you the files for Audison and Hertz so you can calibrate if you choose to use one of these DSPs. So, let me open it up to show you what the switches look like on the top. A lot of people don't know, Audison Hertz are actually the same company. Audison's their upper brand, Hertz is their lower brand. So if you have a Bit 10, a Bit 10D, or a Hertz H8, the power speaker harness is exactly the same, so you can swap them out. Let's say you start with a Bit 10 or a Bit 10D, and then you make uh, changes to your setup and add more amplifier channels. You could actually unplug this and plug in Hertz H8. It's exactly the same. Uh, the software is different though, you have to run different software. So these gain controls here, these lights, you put track one in, you take the radio to your maximum undistorted output and turn these potentiometers until the LEDs start to blink briefly. That's how you do your gain input adjustment, super simple on this. So you'll know when your head unit's clipping and then when you've maximized the inputs, then you go to track two. Track, track two listens to the factory um, head unit and that's the part where it'll say, hey, I see a factory EQ built in, would you like me to remove it? And hit the button and tell it yes, it does its thing. Then you go in and tell it what speakers you want to configure. And then, well, I'll do a video on the Hertz and audience in software after I'm done with the Rockford videos. Uh, my favorite, favorite DSP, and I would never put this thing in a bike because it, it's not going to fit. And I'm sure it's not going to like the vibration. So my two favorite DSPs is the Helix MK2 Pro, or the Helix Ultra, and the Audison Bit1 HD. Bit1 HD, and they also offer Bit1 HD Virtuoso. The main difference is it's got a faster processor, it's got two optical inputs, it's got a ton of features you would never, ever, ever use on a bike. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight input channels, 10 output channels. It is literally one of the most powerful DSPs on the market and a absolute waste of time and money, if you ask me, to put on a motorcycle, but some people do. But uh, I think eight channels on the Hertz H8 is enough for me. 
nine channels on the Audison Bit Nove or ten channels on the Audison Bit Bit One HD. I'm not sure. I think the Virtuoso might be twelve channels and the Helix Ultra might be twelve channels. But um, if your build is that crazy, you already know how to use the DSP, and then you don't need my video to help you. So the basics of DSP, especially when you're using the DSR One. Uh, people don't realize that when you turn on the DSR-1, you use the DSR-1, it's very, very simple to use, and it's basically foolproof. It walks you through step by step, so once you fire up the software and you connect via Bluetooth, it actually asks you what your setup consists of, and you can actually go step by step with pictures. So it's the only DSP on the market that I know is that user friendly. So I'm going to go ahead on the shop phone and walk you through a quick. So you click setup, setup device, and you click the little car in the gear on top. It asks you. Is this a standalone or a T harness install? It's on a Harley, so it's a standalone. Okay, got it. Are you using RCAs? Are you using speaker level? Or are you using coax? The coax input has never been activated by Rockford, so that input will never be selected. So we're using a stock Harley radio, which we have flashed, so we're going to use high level speaker input. Okay, got it. Shows you a little picture reminding you to flip the switch on the side of the DSR1 can't make it any easier click OK got it it says how many inputs will you be using so does your Harley radio offer front to rear fade or is it front only because your Harley came with no rear speakers that's where you select here 90% of the installs you're gonna select front only OK got it and it's showing you a picture hey this is how you connect it you're gonna use the white red and you're gonna go into the white and the gray doesn't get any easier than that. Then you click OK. Then it's asking you, does your setup look like this? Do you have front speakers, rear speakers, and mid bass drivers in the bags? Or front speakers, rear speakers, and subwoofers? You could say no. Do you have a center channel? You could say no. Then this is utilizing all eight channels. It's saying, do you have tweeters in the front? Then six inch mid bass drivers, lid speakers, and subwoofers? That's my setup, so you click OK. OK, got it. Are you using the Rockford bass knob, which is really nice because you can literally plug it into the DSP? Uh, say, yeah, I'm using it. And then it says, what are you using the bass knob for? You could say, I'm using it for sub-level control, or I, wanna, I have a Road King and I want to use it to control the entire volume of the system, or I just want to use it for punch bass. We're going to use it for subwoofer level control. Okay, got it. it. says setup is complete. Click save. Then it gives you a summary of everything that you just set up. To make sure everything looks the way that it should it shows what the input gain is set to internally it shows that the auto signal detect is turned on and it shows that you selected uh, front two-way which is tweeter mid-range rear speakers and a sub so now you can click the home button and then at this point you would go to tune and advanced tune so now this is the part I wanted to show everybody if this is your first time using it The DSP is wide open, so you see how that graph is blue all the way across? Well, that means that you just set up this DSP and it's doing absolutely nothing. It's doing the same thing that not using a DSP would do or putting an aftermarket radio is. It took whatever you had on the input side and passed it straight through the amplifiers. So it did no crossovers, it did no EQ, it did no time delay. It literally is an expensive line level converter. It took your speaker level output and converted it to RCA. So there's no reason to be afraid of the DSP, especially the Rockford DSR-1, because there's your EQ menu, completely flat because there's no EQ set. There's your crossover menu, completely flat because you haven't set any crossovers. There's your time alignment at zero because you haven't set any time alignment. Now trim level is important. So now you set it to pass whatever's in out to the amplifiers. Remember we set our amplifiers to maximum undistorted output. So now, every channel is playing full volume. And you don't want that, you want adjustability when you tune. So the first thing you wanna do 
is you want to adjust all the trim levels to the middle especially on the tweeters you don't want to blow your tweeters up so you go to trim level you go to every speaker set and make sure the trim levels are all in the middle just like that so you notice that channel says tweeters and we're at negative 14 negative 14 because 0 is all the way up then negative 30 would be all the way down so you want to go to negative 14 in the middle so now if you have speakers hooked up and now you can go ahead and turn the volume up since you've lowered everything to a safe level you can actually mute the tweeter just by hitting that button when you hit that button you're going to get an X through the speaker and that channel is now muted so now even before you start tuning you could adjust the volume of your tweeters the volume of your sixes the volume of your eights the volume of your mid bass drivers just basic basic stuff so now that you have everything plugged in you have your volumes lowered so you won't blow anything up that's when you click on the crossover tab and you start inputting the numbers that came with the speakers so I'm gonna input some quick numbers with you so I clicked on the tweeter so by clicking the very very top it shows you a map of the speakers on the bike or the car so you just click on channel 1 and 2 and that's tweeters and it says at the top front tweeters and then we're going to select a number so let's say our tweeter says 5000 so where it says high pass frequency you literally type in 5000 zero, 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 enter and now that tweeter has protection 5000 hertz at a 12 decibel per octave slope I recommend you leave the caps that came with the tweeters on the tweeters in case you make a mistake here then the tweeters still protected but that's it just that simply you told the tweeters you told whatever amps hooked up to the tweeters that hey I don't want anything above uh, below 5k going to this tweeter then you click on the speaker here and you go to the next section of speakers which is I'm, I'm assuming your six inches in your pods and then some people choose to high pass them so they let them play for let's say a hundred all the way up to twenty thousand I don't do that I go let's use the Bama for example the Bama told us that it likes to play from 95 Hertz so you want to click right now it says high pass you want to click until it says band pass then you're gonna have two choices here a top and a bottom so on the bottom I want it to start playing at 95 Hertz and on the top I want to tell it to stop playing at 10,000 Hertz actually I want to bring it a little lower because we told the tweeter to start playing at 5,000 so how about we stop the speaker where this tweeter starts now there's no wrong or right to this you play around with it until it sounds the way you want it to sound but um just to make the math easy since we stopped the tweeter we started the tweeter at 5,000 we're going to stop the mid-range of 5,000 so now we have the Bema playing from 95 Hertz to 5,000 Hertz at a slope of 12 decibels per octave now let's say you have six mines in the lids so let's tell the six mines to play starting at 150 Hertz or whatever the manufacturer said that's a six mine setup then this is very important now you go to the mid base or the subwoofer on a motorcycle it is physically impossible for a mid base driver which most of you run or even a subwoofer to play down below let's say 30 or 40 Hertz we say this is a rider bike it's not a competition bike it doesn't have built bags it has two eights in the bags let's say it has ground zero yellow basket eights that speaker cannot play below 50 or 60 so we don't want to low pass it this is where DSP comes in very important we want to band pass it so we want it to start at a certain point we want it to stop at a certain point so we're gonna go in and we're gonna switch it from all pass which is passing everything to band pass and then the numbers we want to start high because we want to test it out we want to see if the speaker pops or distorts so let's start at 70 We'll start at 70 hertz on the bottom end and on the top end let's say I want it to play up to 500 now these are all numbers you can play around with so now we have a bandpass filter set up the speaker starts playing at 70 hertz and it stops playing at 500 hertz so now we have our mid bass driver set up from 70 to 500 we have our six mine set up from 150 to 20,000 we have our six inch Bama set up from 95 to 5,000 
and we have our ST25 tweeter set up to play from 5k to 20,000 Hertz. Now that we have all the slopes set up, you go back to trim level and you start turning the volume up on the bike. Now, I want everyone to download this free app. It's called RTA Pro. You can get the basic version for free. Now, if you notice as I talk, the meter moves. It's a simple, simple, simple app. So I'm going to talk into the microphone so you can see. And you want to place this, uh, have somebody hold it about 30 inches away from the front speakers, about 20 or 30 inches above the seat. And then it will actually show you what's playing. And then you can see where you need to make adjustments. So, for example, when I'm talking, all these bars are full, but these bars are kind of low. So you're going to play pink noise from the factory head unit. Pink noise is that noise you hear when your TV's on channel 3 and you hear static. Well, when you play pink noise, theoretically, it's supposed to be a flat line from here to here. So with pink noise playing, you're going to see where you have missing energy and where you have too much. And then you can go ahead in the EQ section, EQ every speaker section by section. I know I went really fast. I was trying to keep the video under 30 minutes. It's not, this is not a video on showing you how to set up your DSP. It was just showing you quickly how important it is and how you shouldn't be afraid of it and how you could just plug in the numbers and get it going within 30 minutes. We got it going. So once it's wired, I literally showed you how to get your DSR one basically set up within 20, 30 minutes. Uh, I'm going to start doing step-by-step -step videos for every DSP that we carry here, starting with the DSR ones. So I'm going to get in depth and show you, and then I'm going to use, on purpose, I'm going to use this free app because we have tens of thousands of dollars of tuning equipment. Obviously, I don't expect you to have this at home. So I'm going to show you how to do it the least expensive way possible. So um, hope this helps. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Talk to you tomorrow. Okay, this is a Ground Zero Blast Basket Neo. This is a GZCM 6.5 Neo. They list the frequency response at 250 hertz to 10K to 10,000 hertz. So I would start there. 250 on the low end, 10K on the high end. The Hertz Neo SPL Show 8. Downloaded the graph from their website. This speaker they said has a frequency response of 100 to 8,000 Hertz. So if you look on the graph at 100, you get this huge impedance spike, which means the impedance in the speaker rises way up, which means your amplifier does very little power at that frequency, which means the speaker will not play loud. So you get almost no output. That's why they set the low end there. So you want it to be in here. You don't want it to be down here or else you have to deal with this. So the speaker is not going to play loud here because the impedance is way up, which makes the amplifier reduce power. Then if you look at the graph, this is off axis, this is on axis. So let's say we're on axis. Look what happens past 8K. It sharply drops off. So why would you want the speaker to continue to play tweeter frequency when it doesn't want to and it just drops off? So why not bandpass it and let it play where it likes to play from here to here? And me personally, see where that drops off there? I would move this over. I don't like my mids playing up into tweeter frequency. So me personally, I would bring this line over here somewhere. And this line over here. That way I have this nice signal to deal with. And then if I get the same response, I could bring this down in the EQ. And I can bring this up a little bit and get a nice flat response. It's really not hard. Just got to do a little bit of homework and math.